Okay, so we are live. Hi, everybody. My name is Saul Blinkoff. I'm coming to you live from Los Angeles, California, and it is a pleasure to be with you. And uh, what an incredible lineup of speakers uh, that has been on this. This is incredible. Uh, it's just amazing. It's really one of the first things that I've ever seen where you do bring speakers in from all over the world, and I'm definitely honored to be part of it. Um, I wanted to share a couple ideas. First of all, if you are watching this wherever you're watching from, you should take a moment and feel a sense of accomplishment as you have already proved to yourself and to everyone that you want to watch something that will hopefully add something to your life to engage you or to inspire you. Um, you know, I once heard something from an incredible rabbi, Rabbi Yitzhak Berkowitz, he says, most people, when they hear wisdom or they go to a class or they hear a speaker or read a book, most people, the reason they're going or listening is because they want to hear something that will validate how they already live their lives. But the truth is, before we hear anything, a new class, wisdom, a book, anything, a TED Talk, whatever it is that inspires you, we must have the goal to want to hear something that will change how we live our lives. Not just to be inspired, but to live inspired. You know, so often we get inspired by other things and we hear the inspiration and the next day we don't even recall what the words were. Oh, what did they say? What did they say? What were they saying that was so inspiring? But when we get inspired, we must learn how to take inspiration and turn it into action, to actually apply how we live our lives. I want to share with you all just for a couple of moments some of my own personal story. Uh, I grew up in New York, you know, the five towns, and I remember I was 11 years old, and I went to see the movie E.T., and I remember the credits were rolling, and I tapped my mom at the end of the movie, and I was like, Mom, that's what I want to do someday. And she's like, what, you want to leave planet Earth in a spaceship? And I was like, no, Mom, I want to make movies. You know, I grew up in New York. I didn't know any Hollywood people. I didn't know any filmmakers. All I knew was when I looked up to the screen, it called to me. It was something that I wanted to do. I just had one problem. I had no idea how to do it. So I went to the library. I got books on cameras, lenses, storyboarding. I found out the director of E.T. was a Jewish guy named Steven Spielberg. I thought, oh, if he could do it, I could do it too. I found out that every weekend Spielberg would make movies. So I got a film camera my sister, my brother, and I started making movies. Murder movies, monster movies, kidnap movies. I remember we went, uh, we made a kidnap movie. We tied my sister up to a tree really tight, my twin sister. Afterwards, I went to the house to watch the movie with my parents. I still remember them going, I like the movie, but where's your sister? I said, she's still tied to the tree, what's wrong? <laughs> you know. So I knew I was gonna be a filmmaker. And then I get to high school. And I was walking the halls in high school one day, and somebody came up to me and said, well, what are you going to do when you get out of high school? I said, well, I'm going to be a filmmaker. They're like, no, you don't want to do that. I said, no, I do. I really do. They go, no, you don't, because if you want to be a filmmaker, you're going to have to move out to Hollywood. And Hollywood is filled with strange weirdos. They looked at me and said, you don't want to end up a weirdo, do you? And right then and there, I gave up on my dream of wanting to be a filmmaker because one person told me I would end up a strange weirdo. And it's incredible to me how thinking about that story now, so often in life, we will allow other people to say something to change the trajectory of the path that we're walking or to change how we feel about a goal or a dream that we may have. Well, at that point, I let that person decide how I felt about my dreams and I gave up. I said, I'm not going to be a filmmaker. Forget that. I'll go back to being an artist. So my parents, who are so supportive, got an art teacher to come to my house and she would teach me to draw from life, an amazing teacher. She said, Saul, drawing is about seeing. You have to develop your eye to see the world a certain way. Amazing, and I was terrible at drawing hands. Any artist watching, you know what I'm talking about. Drawing hands is very difficult. I was terrible at drawing hands, and she says, oh, if you're bad at drawing hands, I want you to draw your hand from a different position every single night before you go to bed. And soon after, I got good at drawing hands. And she taught me an incredible lesson that we need to get out of our comfort zone in order to turn our weakness into our strength. What an incredible teacher I had. So there I was, I was gonna be an artist one day until I went to the movies and saw another movie that changed my life. 
I saw the movie The Little Mermaid. That's right, the Disney classic The Little Mermaid, the story of Ariel, Under the Sea, the whole thing. I remember watching the credits of that movie, and I tapped my mom, and I said, Mom, I want to do that someday. She's like, what, you want to fall in love with a fish? I'm like, no, Mom, I want to be a Disney animator. There I was, a junior in high school, and I knew what my dream was. My dream was to become a Disney animator. I just had one problem. I had no idea how to do it. So my incredibly supportive mom took me to Disney World and walked me around Disney World just to ask the Disney cast members, that's what they call their employees, how can my son become a Disney animator? And we found out that I needed to go to a certain school that Disney recruited their artists from. And I went to one of these schools in Columbus, Ohio, the Columbus College of Art and Design. And I had my dream. I was going to be a Disney animator one day. That was my goal. And I found out in order to get into Disney, I needed to have a portfolio filled with life drawing of animals and humans, all figure drawing and anatomy, no cartoon characters. And I worked really hard on my portfolio, sent my best drawings into the Disney studios, and I got rejected the first time. You know what? I, I didn't expect to get in the first time. I just wanted to go through the process. And I remember Disney sent me a letter on Disney stationery. It had my name embossed on there with a gold Mickey Mouse. It was so cool. I was excited that Disney company knew I was alive. I thought that was the coolest thing. They had my name typed on an envelope. Even though I got rejected and didn't get in the first time, they had my name printed there. Saul, thanks for sending your portfolio, but you didn't make it. So I took that letter. I put it up over my desk. It inspired me for another year. Another year goes by. And me and my best friend Andy are drawing nonstop. Andy was one of the best artists in the school. And I remember going to the zoo with him one day. It was a freezing cold day in Columbus, Ohio. Bitter cold. Those of you that live in cold places, you know what I'm talking about. And he and I were there with about 15 other students. And we went and we found these elephants. And there was these elephants walking back and forth. And we did drawings of these elephants walking back and forth and filled our portfolios with these drawings. And I still remember that day. It was just Andy and I drawing these elephants in the freezing cold. And all the other students that we'd gone to the zoo with were in the cafe, in the zoo, and never left the cafe. And I asked one of the guys, how come you never left to go draw the elephants with us? And he says, well, we couldn't go out. I said, why not? And he said, because it's too cold. And at that moment, I knew, okay, someday I'm going to get into Disney. Because all these other people aren't coming out of the cafe because it's so cold. And I knew that I would outwork them. I knew that I wasn't scared of the cold or the pain. And I learned a great lesson in life there. You know, if we're going to achieve greatness in anything in life, we're going to have to go through pain. We're going to have to go through struggle. If you put on a Netflix documentary about anything that inspires you, anything, pick a, pick a biography of somebody that inspires you, believe me, they went through pain. They went through struggle because nobody wakes up great at anything. Well, Andy and I took our drawings, put them together, and sent them into the Disney Studios. Soon after, uh, I remember Andy got a call from Disney that he got in on the internship. My best friend got in, but I got rejected. I did not get in, and I was devastated. I gave up on my dream uh, because reality set in. Reality was Andy was an awesome artist, and I was just average. You know, who did I think I was to get in? I gave up on my dream. Andy goes to Disney World. I'm stuck in Columbus, Ohio for another winter. And then I saw another movie that changed my life. I saw the movie Rudy. That's right, the football player movie. The movie, it's a true story about a guy who's five feet tall. He doesn't have an ounce of athletic ability, and he wants to play football at Notre Dame. Well, Rudy tries to get into Notre Dame, rejected. Tries a second time, rejected. Third time, rejected. But fourth time. You know, if you look at the movie poster for the movie Rudy, it says, when people tell you dreams don't come true, tell them about Rudy. He gets in. And tears are streaming down my face because I'm thinking one thing. If an unathletic guy could get into Notre Dame with an insane amount of hard work, then what I thought was an untalented artist could get into Disney with an insane amount of hard work. And I vowed to never give up again. Then I actually called up Disney the next day, and I got this guy on the phone. I said, how come you didn't accept me? Why didn't I get in? He told me, so you need more perspective in your drawing. He also told me I was the first person to ever call him up and ask him why I got rejected. 
I also learned a great lesson there. You know, in life, we are going to fail. That's what it means to be human. But when we fail, if we find out why we failed, that's the answer key to growing. So I went and put more perspective in my drawing, did lots of new drawings, took the drawings, sent them into Disney, and boom. When you wish upon a... I got in. I got into Disney. Started my dream as a Disney animator. And I got to work on some exciting movies. Movies like Pocahontas, Hunchback, Mulan, Tarzan. Just some great memories working at the studios then. And it was around that time that I ended up going to Israel. I went to Israel on a program called Israelite and started learning about Judaism. Now, look, I grew up in a conservative home, you know, conservative docs, whatever label you like. My parents lived a conservative Jewish life. And even though I followed what they did, I really never asked myself, well, how do I fit into the Jewish people? What identity do I subscribe to when it comes to being a Jew? So when I ended up going to Israel, I really went with a question of how do I fit into the Jewish people? And that's when I met Rabbi Benny Friedman and Rabbi David Aaron two incredible rabbis, and they taught me such incredible wisdom. I still remember Rabbi Benny Friedman teaching me about mezuzah. A lot of you watching right now, you know what a mezuzah is. Well, I remember him walking in. The rabbi walks in the first day, and he says to us, how many of you know what a mezuzah is? And I'm like, yeah, I know what it is, the thing on the doorway. And he says, well, what's it for? And I said, I don't know. Doesn't it like guard your house from evil spirits or something? I didn't know. He goes, well, hold on a second. What's inside the mezuzah? And I go, well, I think there's a piece of paper in there, but I didn't know what it said on there. And he looks to us and he says, what's on the piece of paper is the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. That's what's written on the mezuzah. And that Shema comes out of the Torah itself. And we're commanded in the Torah to take the Shema and put it where? On our doorway. It's an odd thing if you think about it. I still remember the rabbi looking at us and saying that, you know what Torah is? Torah is a love letter from God to humanity. That's what Torah is. It's the most precious thing we have as the Jewish people. It's literally the greatest gift that the creator of the world ever gave to humanity. And we're commanded to take part of that Torah because that's what the Shema is. And we're commanded to put it on our doorway. If you got a letter from the creator of the world, because that's what Torah is. It's a love letter from God to humanity. If you get a letter from God, where would you put it? You wouldn't put it in a doorway. You'd put it in a safe. You'd put it under a glass jar with a red laser security system. It'd be an incredible thing. And yet we're commanded to put it on a doorway. And the rabbi looks to us and this is what he says. He says, you know why we put it on a doorway? Because a doorway is a place of transition. You see, you go from your home out into the world. You pass through a doorway. And a mezuzah is not a thing. It's an opportunity. We pass through a doorway. A mezuzah is there to remind us, oh, this is an opportunity to ask myself a question. I'm going out into the world. What kind of a world do I want to create? What am I living for? To clarify what our goals are. And, you know, think about you're coming into your home. When I was growing up, you know, I, my mom was like, you know, wipe off your feet. You're coming into the house. Well, there's that mezuzah. We're coming into our house. We can ask ourselves a question. I'm coming into the house. What kind of a home do I want? What are the values I want to have in my home? Why do I need a partner to help me create a home? I was really inspired by these ideas. And I said to the rabbi the last day, I said, you know, I never knew this before growing up. And he said to me, Saul, it doesn't matter what you know. It matters what you do with what you know. And all I knew is at that moment, something went off inside me. It was like a light switch. I didn't want to just be Jewish anymore. I wanted to live Jewish. You see, it was then that I first learned that Torah is literally the instruction manual for living. The word Torah is a Hebrew word. It means directions. It means instructions. Those of you watching, I'm sure a lot of you have this book. This is a bestseller, by the way. If you think Harry Potter's big, that's nothing compared to this. And if you don't have one of these, if you don't have Torah, you should pick one of these up. You should have one of these in your house. And I still remember learning Torah and learning the idea that Torah is really not a history book. And while it is our history, it's really tools for living. It's known as Torah Chaim, tools for living. I want to be a better human being. What does Torah tell me about that? 
you know, I want to be a better father. What does Tover tell me about wanting to be a better father? I want to control myself. Or whatever it is we want to do in life, this is the answer key to helping us through it. Well, I get back to Disney as a director, and I remember thinking of not as myself as a director, but as a Jewish director, because now I wanted to, you know, embrace my Jewish identity. So I took uh, the Winnie the Pooh movie that I was directing at the time called Winnie the Pooh Springtime with Rue. And as a director, I have to go over to this drawing of the 100-acre wood where Winnie the Pooh lives. And I go over to the drawing, and my job is to approve the drawing of the tree where Winnie the Pooh lives and look at the 100-acre wood and then sign the drawing so it can go to the color department to be painted. So I look at the proportions. Everything looks good. And I sign the thing. Yeah, that's good. Let's go to the color department to be painted. Well, everybody leaves the room. I'm alone with the drawing for a second. Then I think to myself, wait, don't Disney people like hide things in the, in the movies? You ever hear that? That Disney artists will draw things, they'll hide things in the movies. So no one was looking. I sharpened the pencil. I went over Winnie the Pooh's house. And next to his doorway, I drew in a mezuzah. That's right. I hid a mezuzah in the movie. Now he's not Winnie the Pooh. He's Winnie the Jew. <laughs> Well, now I was starting to live a Jewish filmmaker's life. I started putting Judaism into everything I did. As a matter of fact, the next movie I directed, Kronk's New Groove, the sequel to Emperor's New Groove, I was reading the script that says Kronk gets married. And I thought, oh, this is great. Let's give him a chuppah. I got my wedding album that has the chuppah with the calla lily flowers that my wife loved. And we hid that in the movie. That's in the movie. There's actually a moment where Kronk steps on the glass. Mazel tov. It's in the movie. And today I live in Hollywood, and people say to me all the time, how do you live in Hollywood and balance living an observant Jewish life? And I say, how can you not? You know, I live in a town where people are so focused on getting that gold statue, uh, getting that Oscar, getting those accolades, getting those awards. And for me personally, I don't get caught up in that. I try not to let that dictate what I do. And, um, you know, look, I come home on a Tuesday night or a Wednesday night, I just finished being a supervising producer for the studio DreamWorks Animation on a show called Madagascar, A Little Wild. It's a preschool show. And if I come home on a Tuesday or a Wednesday night, I'm busy. I'm sitting at the table with my family. If I get a phone call, my iPhone dings. If I get a text, it's a work call. I got to go. But my kids know that on Friday, daddy shuts his phone off. And I'm not just home. I'm home. You know, they know that I'm going to have Shabbat dinner with them. And it's the most incredibly empowering thing that when Shabbos comes, I shut off my phone. I shut off the technology and I'm there with my kids. And I want to tell you, you know, I only have about four minutes left. I want to share with you an idea. You know, um, the Ramchal, uh, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato. If you don't have this book, boom, this is a great one to get. Uh, This is a book I learned with an incredible rabbi, Rabbi Shalom Denbo. He's also an incredible moil. So if you're watching and you need a moil, check out Rabbi Shalom Denbo. Incredible. That's a plug for him. He's amazing. I started learning this book with him. And the Ram Chal teaches us a beautiful idea about Torah and a way to look at the world. The Ram Chal says this. He says, Yesod HaChesidus Beshoresh HaAvoda HaTamima. He says the the foundation of what life is about is she is barir v'yisames, to clarify and make real one thing. He's saying to us, we have to wake up every day with clarity, and we have to live the clarity to understand one thing. Ma chavoso be'olamo. What am I responsible for in the world? To wake up every day and not think, what is it that I want to do to make me happy? But how do I take responsibility for the world? You see the same thing in the movie The Lion King. That's right. There is Torah in The Lion King. Simba thinks being king is he can do whatever he wants. He learns after he is alone in Hakuna Matata world that, you know what? I can't just live in Ghana, in the Garden of Eden, and do whatever I want. Because Nala shows up and she says, Simba, you got to come back with me. Scar's taking over everything. And if you don't come back, everyone's going to die. He's like, Hakuna Matata, I'm staying here. No worries. She goes, no, no, no. You are responsible. That's what it means to be great. She leaves. Simba sees his father's reflection in the water. He looks up to the clouds. Remember who you are. He goes back, defeats Scar, and Lion King becomes the biggest animated movie all time of all time, BF, before Frozen. Not because we love movies about lions, 
but because that movie shows us what true greatness is, waking up every day with the mindset that I want to take responsibility for the world, that I want to give to humanity. We are days away from Shavuos. The Jewish people are getting the Torah. That is literally the time when we accept the responsibility to be a light into the nations. And God is giving us the Torah, the tools for living. This is our time to get our mindset into receiving the Torah. It is known as Matan Torah Senu. The time of Torah is, is a gift. It's our gift. But in order to have a gift, we have to appreciate why we need the gift. To just want something, it's not enough. We have to realize why we need it. And as we're getting ready for Shavuos this year, may each one of us take a moment and realize how much, not that we want Torah, but how much we need it. That the greatest gift that the creator of the world has ever given humanity is the toolbox that we can grow into becoming our unlimited potential. May each one of us take that uh, responsibility and vow to do the work to grow, to become better versions of ourselves. It's really been an honor for me to be here with you sharing a, a couple of ideas. I wish each one of you an incredibly meaningful Shavuos and to take that time and to really realize why we want to have that ultimate relationship with the creator of the world. You know, they say that we should have devakis to Hashem. It's a word we hear a lot, devakis, to cling to God. If someone throws you a life preserver, you're not holding on to it like, you know what, maybe I'll hold on to this. You know you hold on to it with everything you have, because if you're in the ocean drowning and you let go of that life preserver, you're going to die. We have to have devakis to God, to the creator of the world, because we have to realize that if we let go of him, then we might as well be dead. How do we have the vacus to God, to the creator of the world? We hold on to this, Torah, Torah's Chaim. Thank you so much for having me here, wishing all of you around the world an incredibly meaningful Shavuos. And again, thanks so much for having me. Uh, check out, I have a podcast called Life of Awesome, where I share ideas from Torah about all aspects of life and interview great people. Again, it's called Life of Awesome. And I'm also on Instagram. It's Saul Blinkoff. You can check me out there too. Hope everyone is well. Thanks again for having me.